the are you still continuing from with a lot of the scriptorium that you did uh, back in the day? Mm. Yeah, I am. Where's that book? I was gonna show that the one over there. Bring that here. Oh yeah. <clears throat> so this is from a couple of years back, but at this stage, I was let's see, I was really interested in Mayan hieroglyphs. My own hieroglyphs and Egyptian hieroglyphs. So I was interested in, in, in hieroglyphic writing, the idea of pictographic writing. And on the days that I would do Egyptian here, I've got I've got six I did one, two, three, four, five, I did six languages a day, scriptorium. I forget what books I was copying, but um, next to Egyptian I have uh, French, Latin, German, Sanskrit, Old Norse, and Greek in the days that I did um, uh, Mayan. I have uh, Spanish, Russian, Persian, Hindi, Hanja, and what this looks like. Some medieval Germanic language. I'm using the old fractal sprint down here. So uh, I would uh, really, you know, concentrate on copying artwork here. I, I don't know if you can see here. I've got different colors for the different things. So I really tried to make an artistic uh, production, like I was saying. And then, I, if I remember, in these days here, I would write in between. I would write my own thoughts in looks like mostly German and and, and Latin. Um, uh, and try to do sort of my own symbolic pictographic writing. I would also just draw my own pictures of cats or something. Yeah. So, yeah, try to, uh, again, I, I feel that my life has been out of balance in terms of just being focused on languages. I'm always trying to bring in more art or music, or I'd love to bring in, I'd love to bring in more math and science. I'd love it if there were like an academy of, of, of science and numbers like my academy. I'd sign up as a student there in a moment and, you know, and be learning something uh, different if I, if I had that opportunity. But since you're in the... Oh, you said like you were already advanced 20 years ago mm -hmm. and now you're even more advanced. Like, uh, do you have a feeling of where you might be 20 years from now? Well, I don't necessarily mean that I'm, you know, at, at, at C2 in language X where I was in C1 in language X 20 years. I'm not talking in those terms. I'm talking in the overall terms of my understanding of language, of, of the relationship between languages, of my um, ability and satisfaction to read monumental works of, of literature in the languages that I've set out to read them in. So, um, I've just made more progress along those lines. I've, I've gotten um, better at, yeah, at, at, at sort of comparing and contrasting and knowing things, but you know, in terms of actual skills in particular language. I mean, back then I was, uh, I was much closer to my time in Korean and I uh, uh, was working on some Korean grammars or Korean books for Dunwoody Press. And um, since then I've, concentrated much more extensively on, on Arabic and, you know, particularly in all my time in Dubai. And so, uh, you know, I've tried to, you know, I, I haven't lost my Korean in any way, shape or form, but it's not what it was, you know, back, back then, whereas my Arabic is better. So, you know, it's sort of a balancing act of, you know, where you can put your time and attention to keep, you know, to keep everything sort of in, in, in good working condition if you, that's, if that's important to you, it is important to me. So would you say you plan, you sort of plan your life around the languages? Or to what extent do you do that? Um, language learning is my bread and, and my essence, my, uh, it's what I am, it's what I do, you know, and I'm not, I'm not even learning them anymore in the sense of like, you know, the. I don't know the, the structure or the words and I need to put something in. I'm learning them in the sense that like, okay, let's really take it up a notch. Let's see what literature there is in these. Let's see how they're connected to other languages. Let's see how I can think in them if I can. Or I guess like, do you make major life choices around 
like languages you want to learn. I guess you did when you moved to Korea. Yeah, I did. I, I you know, I, I, you know, I moved to Korea to learn Korean. I moved to Lebanon and to the United Arab Emirates to focus on Arabic. So those are major life choices that I've made around. You know, those are those are the two most difficult languages that I've learned, and the ones that I really needed to be immersed in for as, as much as I could, as long as I could, and the ones for which. Despite how much progress I've made in them and all the effort I put into them, I kind of have the least to show for it because they're, you know, they're so they're so difficult. Um, so, um, yeah, so I've made those those choices, but you know, just the the overall choice. I mean, I there are bifurcating paths in life, and I guess there were paths where I could have gone off and become a businessman and, and become wealthy at a certain point if I'd <laughs> chosen to to lead that kind of life. But if you're so constituted like I am, and I think you are, and you know, and I'm happy to find a fair numbers of people are that, you know, I mean, you don't want to be struggling or poor or anything like that, but it's more important to you to, you know, to, to answer the questions that your mind is, is seems set up to ask. We've got this, you know, these, these laws written in our heart that say, ask these questions, you know, and, and find what's the right thing and, and seek out the truth. And, um, you know that's what you have to do, and and you know not you know so, um, I have just structured my life sort of around that overall scholarly path or quest, and that's just sort of who I am. So, and do you have advice for people who aren't sort of they are interested in languages, but they, but not to the extent that they will sort of uh, make that like a major life uh, that they will structure the, their life around it. I, I think so. I mean, uh, people like that come to me. I mean, I, I put my videos like this one up here. You know, I talk about my quirky, quirky, quixotic philosophy about language learning and its importance and how it has philosophical and spiritual, you know, dimensions as well as mental ones. And people like that come and, and ask my advice too. And so uh, if they can find some, you know, value in what I have to say, I'm very happy to help anybody that, uh, that I can do that for. But I do think that there is also this sort of contingent that's very small in any one given place on the planet, but now with this, you know, global interconnectedness that we have, um, we can uh, virtually, you know, come, come together. And so I think we're, you know, we're, we're seeing that in, in the academy. We have, uh, on the one hand, we have um, people who've been there um, from the beginning and they're, you know, they're just in, you know, literature you know, German literature or French literature, or Spanish, they're just, that's, they're interested in one language and reading it and that's fine, that's what they're for. But we have other people who maybe start out like that and now you know who they are, we're talking about. We've got a lot of people who are doing four, five, six different classes, you know, and they're interested in sort of a bigger, larger project. And so um, that kind of person, I don't think has many other uh, places or venues or options to go to. So, you know, I think I can, uh, if I can give advice to anybody and everybody, I'm happy to do that. But I'd like to, you know, people who are passionate about it and don't have many other places to go to say, I want, I'm not just passionate or excited about learning languages because languages are fun, but I'm, I'm really, you know, I like, I, I, I do like this sort of deeper philosophical aspect of what languages are and how they make my mind work and how they're connected and how they make me understand, you know, the thought process. So, you know, and, and I can do that above all by, by reading and literature. So that's why, um, what you asked earlier on, um, I don't know when I started using the term polyglottery or polyliteracy or whatnot, but um, mm. I almost always think about, talk about, feel about polyliteracy, polyliteracy these days. I don't think about polyglottery so much mm. anymore. I think it's interesting that you say that, but then also you now you're doing more speaking practice. Mm -hmm. Like, what was the relation of like speaking to reading proficiency? Well, you know, because you're in the Latin course where we're reading Augustine, where Augustine talked about seeing Saint Ambrose reading silently and everybody being shocked. So, um, in you know, it might have been because there was no punctuation or space between the words, so but you had to read aloud in ancient times. Reading, reading quietly is a sort of a a modern innovation. It seems nice. It seems normal. I remember the idea of reading aloud made it seem like stupid. You know, it's like you can read faster if you read quietly. You know, why would you want to you know, slow yourself down? But um, 
I, I think that particularly, like I said, for languages like we're doing, Latin and, and other things where you can really make the text come alive, but so many um, medieval epic poems and things like that too, I mean, it's just the only way you can do them justice is to, to read them alive. That They were meant for oral delivery and even things that weren't necessarily, um, you just so often can hear things or pick things out when you particularly read things aloud with, with narrative flair. So what I've discovered is that you need to think in the language. You need to speak the language. You need, in order to think in the language, you have to speak the language because you have to, thinking is sort of internalized, you know, hearing yourself speak. So you have to speak the language so that you can think in it. And when you can think in it, then you can read it much better. Then you can take the text and you can look at it and you can say, but I, I just read this and I understand all the words. I understand the grammar, but I don't understand what it's saying. So is there a way I can read it differently? Say with narrative flair, is there a way that I can put the intonation to show some sort of, I don't know, some sort of emotion, some sort of, you know, delivery? How would a person speaking this under these circumstances say it? So and that's something that's surprising to me. I do think I'm, I'm good at it now and I'm getting better because I, I practice it. Like I said, it's the first thing every morning, two hours, two hours a day, at least. Um, but I'll be honest, most people who are highly intelligent, highly educated, stuff like that, doesn't mean they can read well out loud at all. Um, many people are, are, are quite challenged to do that. Um, you know, so uh, to pick up a text and to, to read it and to make it come alive so that others can hear it and feel it, uh, I think that's very important. Um, so it's, to me, um, reading aloud is sort of the, 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 the the, the the ultimate kind of reading now uh, for these kind of things so it's it's um an interesting development yeah and when did uh, your opinion on that sort of change like, was there the, a specific moment that made you realize how important that was hmm um i don't know there's a specific moment but like i said it was um probably just part of the evolution of my attitude towards audiobooks which you know I, again i i remember sort of just being horrified by the idea of them and then thinking oh well i can use them as tools for foreign languages and then to like think, you know wait a minute this is adding a whole level of interpretation and really enjoying it and and you know and finding talented narrators and emulating them and then trying to first emulating them while shadowing and then trying to emulate them you know while while just speaking on my own mm. and have you considered like sort of making audiobooks of your own for more obscure text yeah I, I i have i've made lots of them and i'm trying to think of a way to do something with them because I don't know which or any of them might be of interest to other people, but I think some of them might. And like I say, I, I you know, I start every morning by um, recording myself, and I just discovered that in order to make sure that I'm delivering with the same kind of articulation, and you know, I've, I've got decades of experience as a classroom professor, so you just there's a way that you deliver, there's a way that you get your voice across, and so when you're doing that, you really feel something, and then. You know, there are other ways you can do some, some mutter down. Blah, 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 blah. So I just recording myself aloud, make sure that I'm I'm doing that. And so I, I don't, most of the time I don't listen to myself. The idea is that I can listen to myself. And that was a good way of sort of learning how to think in dead languages like Latin that you don't have somebody to speak with. You record yourself and then you listen to yourself. That was very important as a, sort of getting that voice in your head because you don't hear other people giving you that voice. So, um, I did that with that, but then I've got lots of other things that I've recorded, uh, and I've just sort of got sitting as, as files cluttering up my uh, hard drive, but uh, I already talked to Chris about maybe setting up a page on the website where you could put um, books like that, because I do read um, uh, things that are, I read narrative things in, in Latin, you know, for myself to read or for my, myself to enjoy. I read, uh, um, I've always said I, I can... I don't know, now people put me to test, but I've always said that I can read like certain kinds of grammar books, like other people read novels. I don't know how much grammar and flair I can put into the excitement of reading, but I really enjoy reading grammar books a lot. I really enjoy reading comparative grammar books and, you know, uh, and old fashioned textbooks that explain a language and give the vocabulary and give some sentences and translate them. And so, um, 
I really find that reading that kind of thing just makes you know make makes it all come alive. So yeah, I've got lots of um, I've got lots of stuff that 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 I read for yeah for medieval Middle High German and Old Norse and Old French and Latin and, and lots of stuff that I've got lots of files sort of building up. So if there's interest, I'm happy to share them. I also notice you read a lot of uh, obscure books or or like a. Uh, like a lot of stuff on like archive.org mm -hmm. and I'm wondering how do you find those books that you're interested in because I, I can't imagine there being like on Goodreads people will say like 10 Old Norse books you have to read <laughs> <laughs> like how do you find these things um you know I try not to oh. I try the Internet Archive is, is wonderful, particularly when you don't have access to a big university library anymore or something like that. But it's so easy to spend so much time on there finding so many things that you're you know, never going to touch and can't even read. So um, I, I've got more than enough material, you know, already stockpiled here, there, everywhere that I could never read till I die. But um, yeah, you just hear about something, you look for it, you find it's on Internet Archive, and then, you know, down at the bottom, there's like similar books, and you see other versions of it and other things, and you, it's like any other dopamine hit, you just start clicking on it, and uh, you find lots of related things. So, yeah, just, just looking for one thing, finding it leads to, leads to others. But um, I have found, um, I do aspire to um, really, 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 really good at good in Latin. I'd like to have my Latin be like my English. Um, yeah. And to do that, there's just so much to read across the centuries, across the millennia of different types of things. And um, still for understanding, you know, getting something, finding so many things from, from like old Norse sagas that have been translated into Latin, to, to modern novels, to other things like that. So when you already know the story and then you're seeing it uh, in that language, reading it, you know, just makes you really understand how that structure. And of course you're reading somebody else's translation into it, but when you read enough variety, enough different things, really it makes it, it all come alive. So um, yeah, there's just, just tons of stuff that I you know, want to read aloud. Are you enjoying these videos? Try subscribing to the Alexander Arguelles newsletter for more language learning content. Each month, receive musings from the professor's desk, hear student testimonials, and get book and video recommendations that will enhance your self-education. The link is in the description below. Please subscribe. You will not regret it.